from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Kayode Okikiolu. Tonight, federal government confirms escape of 64 high-profile terror suspects following last night's prison attack in the FCT. The president is disappointed over failure of intelligence as ISWAP claims responsibility. Shake up in the federal cabinet as the seven newly appointed ministers are sworn in. OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Barkindo buried in Yola Adamawa State following his death late last night, shortly after his public engagement in Abuja. And the embattled British Prime Minister Boris Johnson refuses to resign as calls grow for him to leave number 10 down in street. On business news tonight, global oil price benchmark Brent crude falls below $100 per barrel for the first time since April amid concerns over global recession. On sports news tonight, Rafa Nadal overcomes an injury to beat Taylor Fritz in five sets to set up a semi-final clash against Maverick Australian Nick Kyrgios at Wimbledon. And from Abuja, two APC chieftains ask court to stop INEC from replacing Kabiru Masari as running mate to the party's presidential candidate, says substitution of vice presidential candidate is unconstitutional. It was about this time last night when terrorists in their numbers brazenly attacked the Kujé Correctional Center in the nation's capital, Abuja, freeing hundreds of inmates while one security personnel and four inmates died in the process. The Defense Minister, Major General Bashir Magashi, who visited the facility, confirmed the escape of 64 high-profile Boko Haram suspects in the attack. The minister also revealed that the facility accommodates 994 inmates and over 800 escaped, although over 300 of them have been retrieved. In the meantime, the Islamic State of West Africa province, ISWAP, has claimed responsibility for the attack. It's the morning after at the Kujé Correctional Center following an attack by suspected Boko Haram terrorists. Officers and men of the correctional service take stock of burnt vehicles littering the premises. The retrieval process is ongoing as some of those rearrested are returned to the facility. The Minister of Defense visits the facility on an assessment tour. What actually happened, they came in numbers, they gained entrance into the prison and they released some of the inmates and uh, which we are now following to see the kind of inmates they released. The people who came to do these uh, activities, from the records, we believe that they belong to a particular group and most likely they are Boko Harams because we have sizable number of Boko Harams that are in detention and uh, presently we could not locate any of them. All the number, I think there are about 64 okay. years in the prison and none of them now is available. They have all escaped. The Kujé Correctional Facility houses some high-profile inmates, including suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police, Mr. Abba Kiari. However, a statement from the Correctional Service confirms the safety of the high-profile inmates, adding that 879 inmates escaped and over 400 of them have so far been retrieved. These people came specifically, we understand they are Boko Haram, they came specifically for their uh, co-conspirators. And uh, But in order to get them, some of them are in general population, so they broke out and other people in that general population escaped as well. But many of them have returned. They have reported themselves to the police, some have returned, some 
we have successfully retrieved from the bushes where they're hiding. And right now, at least we have retrieved about 300 out of about 600 that got out of the jail cells. One person died in the incident, while three others were injured. The attackers had reportedly broken into the facility from the back, creating a big hole on the perimeter fence using explosives. From time to time we had explosions, which I think resulted in the walls that are falling that is behind the prison, which I just noticed early this morning. And uh, well, for the casualty, I cannot say anything because I did not see any dead body, but I'm told that there are very minimal casualties. After inspecting the facility, the FCT minister asks community leaders to cooperate with security agencies in arresting all fleeing inmates. Today is not a time for a lot of speech making. I've just come, I've seen what is here on ground. I've commiserated with the controller general and I want to also assure them that the local community under the leadership of His Royal Highness the Gomo of Kuje has been informed to summon all the local heads and village chiefs and community leaders so that those who have escaped here would be traced and would be found. Although normalcy appears to have returned to the facility, more security personnel are on the ground as the search for the remaining escapees continue. In the meantime, President Mohamed Buhari says he is disappointed at the failure of intelligence to prevent the attack on Kujay Correctional Center. The president, who was on his way to Dakar, Senegal, took a 30-minute detour and visited the facility where he asked a series of questions of the intelligence system and demanded a comprehensive report. According to a statement by his spokesman, Garaba Shehu, President Buhari said, I am disappointed with the intelligence system. How can terrorists organize, have weapons, attack a security installation and get away with it? The president also asked how the defenses at the prison failed to prevent the attack, amongst other questions. Meanwhile, the statement from the presidency also reacted to criticisms of the president's trip to Dakar, Senegal, to join other leaders for the IDA for Africa summit, saying that governments don't stop working because of terrorist threats. President Buhari says to cancel the trip to Senegal would mean that the terrorists are successful in calling the shots something that no responsible government in the world will allow. And more reactions to that attack, this time from Nigeria's former Interior Minister, General Abdurrahman Dembezo, who blamed the attack on the failure of the security agencies to act on available intelligence and the poor state of the correctional center, which he describes as far below acceptable standards. General Dembezo, while calling for a thorough investigation into the incident, also asked that Prison staff placed in charge of such responsibility must be held accountable for such failure. He was speaking on our program, Politics Today. No matter how uh, defensive, you know, is how, how well defended such facility uh, has been organized, if the response time uh, to such emergency is not there. It means nothing. So which means there is clear, you know, uh, uh, issue uh, between uh, the monitoring itself and even the capacity to respond. Uh, so these things will have to go together. It also shows, tells us one thing, that uh, the security agencies are mostly operating in silos. They are not working together. Because if they do, then the, the, when the intelligence is there, because I understood that they had information uh, beforehand that there was possibility that such a attack would take place. It's either those who were there physically to be able to defend that place, do not have the capacity to do so, or they were lousy in, their, in doing their job. 
Nigeria must learn from the attacks on correctional centers because of the impact it has on the security situation in the country. This is a position of security analysts who reacted to the attack on the Kujé Correctional Center by terrorists. Those who spoke to Channel's television want the government to take steps to address the situation. The attack on the Kujé Medium Security Custodial Center in the Federal Capital Territory raises a lot of questions about the security situation in the country because of the caliber of inmates housed in the facility. It is the latest occurrence in a spate of jailbreaks that has been unraveling in the country since 2010. In the past 14 months alone, there have been eight jailbreaks, more than double the number of such incidents in the previous three years. Some of the attacks that come to mind include the attacks on facilities in Oweri, Bochi, Ubiaja, Kano, Jos, Kaba, and Oyo states. Some of these inmates are suspects that are being tried for cases uh, revolving around terrorism. And we know that uh, a significant number of them have the knowledge and the know-how to boost the capacity of these terrorists that are out there. So unfortunately, it's, um, it doesn't look very good. But the implications are obvious. It uh, brings a lot of uh, insecurity. People are apprehensive that uh, they are not safe. Having known that these people are, uh, you know, they are within the society. And having such people in the society it does not mean well for us. Most of the jailbreaks seem unconnected. However, the attacks are carried out in a similar manner using explosives, according to security analysts who want the government to learn from these attacks. We must not wait for it to happen. We've got to raid and raid and raid. Whether places that cannabis is used in their hemp, places we think drug is used, there must be close collaboration and synergy with the NDLEA and other security forces, even with the EFCC, talking of uh, financial crimes, because some of this also require uh, the use of money. There is a pattern of vulnerability that is quite consistent with our correctional services. There are two reasons. One has to do with the internal security arrangement within those um, facilities. Um, inmates have access to phones. They are able to communicate with the outside world freely. Their physical security arrangement is as good as, as zero. For now, troops have taken over the Kujé facility as calm is restored. However, it's instructive to heed the advice of security analysts on the need for accountability on the part of the officials who are tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that the facility is safe and secure. Meanwhile, before the president's visit to the correctional center, he had presided over the weekly FEC meeting where he reshuffled the cabinet and administered the oath of office on seven newly appointed ministers. Our correspondent Gloria Mezioke reports that the new ministers took the oath shortly before the commencement of the FEC meeting at the council chamber. Exactly 14 days after President Mohamed Buhari submitted seven names of ministerial nominees to the Senate for confirmation, the President conducts a swearing-in ceremony after they were successfully affirmed a week later by the Senate. <laughs> Seven of the new ministers from Abia, Akwaibom, Rivers, Ondo, Kano, Imo, and Eboi are sworn in and assigned portfolios during the brief ceremony. The new ministers replace those who resigned their appointments from cabinet in April this year to contest for various elective offices during the 2023 general elections. I expect you to carefully study your sectors, take wise counsel, reach out to key stakeholders, consult and collaborate with all our cabinet colleagues and focus on driving key programs already initiated by this administration. Barely a few months to go, the president reassigns four ministers. Former Minister of State for Transport, Mrs. Bimisola Saraki, is assigned to the Ministry of Mines and Steel as Minister of State. 
Former Minister of State for Health, Dr. Olorinibe Mamora, is posted to the Ministry of Science and Technology. Former Minister of Environment, Mrs. Sharon Ikiazo, is appointed the Minister of State for Niger Delta Affairs. And the former Minister of State for Works and Housing, Mr. Muazu Jaji Sambo, is appointed as the Minister of Transportation. You must resist bad counsel, resist temptation, and be circumspect in your utterances and conduct. You must totally eschew corruption and be above board because if caught, there will be no sacred cows. However, this move raises questions on the capacity of the ministers to deliver on their mandates given the remaining months in the life of the current administration. If they serve with integrity and they are able to work collaboratively together with the bureaucracy of the ministries where they have been put, I think they can still make a meaningful impact. But if there is a war of attrition between the substantive minister and minister of state on one hand and the ministers and the bureaucracy on the other, then nothing much will be achieved because the truth be said, this administration is in dire need of patrons. Before the meeting, the Federal Executive Council held a minute silence in honor of the former Secretary General of OPEC, Mr. Part two after the break, the president hands the APC flag to the party's candidate in the forthcoming governorship election in Oshun State, Mr. Boiga Oyotola. That's in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on channels television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Federal government confirms escape of 64 high-profile terror suspects following last night's prison attack in the FCT. The president is disappointed over failure of intelligence as ISWAP claims responsibility. Shake-up in the federal cabinet as seven newly appointed ministers are sworn in. OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Barkindo buried in Yola, Adamawa State, following his death late last night after his public engagement in Abuja. And the embattled British Prime Minister Boris Johnson refuses to resign as calls grow for him to leave number 10 down in street. Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, Mohamed Barkindo, has been laid to rest in Iola, the Adamawa state capital. The OPEC chief, whose tenure was due to expire this month, died last night at the age of 63. It's still unclear what led to his death, which occurred just hours after he met with President Muhammad Buhari at the villa, where the president had praised him for his work at OPEC over the last six years while also celebrating his achievements before and during his appointment. Mr. Barkindo was first elected as OPEC Secretary General in July 2016 for a three-year tenure and was re-elected in 2019 for another three years and was due to leave office in a few weeks. Dr. Mohamed Sanisu Barkindo is an internationally recognized diplomat who worked for more than three decades in OPEC that included the movers and shakers of the world oil industry. Dr. Barkindo was first appointed Nigeria's delegate to OPEC in 1986 and rose to become its secretary general in 2016, a post he was to hold for six years till the end of July 2022. Mr. Barakindo oversaw one of the most turbulent periods in the organization's history, beginning with the creation of the OPEC Plus coalition just months after his appointment. Just months after his appointment in summer of 2016. Mr. Barakindo established the once unthinkable partnership with non-OPEC members in the declaration of cooperation in 2016. He was OPEC Secretary General during the pandemic and the Russian-Ukraine hostilities which started in February of 2022. In his role as OPEC Secretary General, he is said to have aggregated the interests of his organization and those of the global oil industry, including rival producers of shale in the U.S., striking an unlikely rapport that sued years of acrimony between the producers. ...of Nigeria's energy calendar. 
He was expected home as a guest speaker in one of his last official assignments at the ongoing Nigerian Oil and Gas Conference in the nation's capital territory, Abuja, when he made a very compelling statement about the current state of the global oil economy and its future. In charge of affairs of OPEC has been a very challenging time for the global oil industry. But prior to that engagement, he had gone to the villa to meet with Mr. President, who showered encomiums on him. So it was a great deal of shock that barely hours after, he was gone. Many of those who had an opportunity to have interacted with him had this to say. Very brilliant fellow, rose to the highest point of, uh, of work or position in NNPC as uh, Group Managing Director of NNPC. And since he left that position, he has engaged in the industry positively for the industry and for the country. Mr. Bakinde was also the Group Managing Director of NNPC between 5th January 2009 to 6th April 2010. More recently, he's actually been a very strong uh, advocate for inclusiveness in the debates about the energy transition. Uh, to have a place uh, for us as um, uh, a country, but also for member countries of OPEC. I think you'll be remembered for really navigating the industry through those very turbulent times, especially from 2020 to, uh, to sadly 2022. A Condolos register has been opened here at the OPEC stand um, at the ongoing conference of the Nigeria Oil and Gas here in Abuja. That's the picture, and that is the condolence register. It therefore means he won't be able to tell us that story again. But some of us can tell that story to say that this is a man that unified the globe in terms of balancing economics and energy supply. And he will be remembered for his fight for energy security, energy sufficiency, amidst geopolitical tensions. From here in Abuja, Lou Phillips, Channel Television News. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari says he's deeply saddened by the death of Mr. Mohamed Barkindo. The special advisor to the president on media and publicity, Mr. Femi Adeshino, disclosed this in a statement hours after the shocking news of the OPEC Secretary General's death was announced. According to the president, he was a remarkable gentleman and an enormous national asset whose undeniable brilliance and legacies as a dedicated public servant will remain a reference point in the oil and gas industry, the international development sector and the environment. President Buhari conveyed his deepest condolences to the late Secretary General's family, colleagues at OPEC, as well as the government and the people of Adamawa State. Meanwhile, the OPEC Secretariat has described the late Secretary General as a much-loved leader whose passing is a profound loss to the entire OPEC family, the industry, and the international community. OPEC also extends its condolences to his family, friends, colleagues, loved ones, and his home country, Nigeria. The message is contained on the organization's Twitter handle, which reads, This tragedy is a shock to the OPEC family. We express our sorrow and deep gratitude for the over 40 years of selfless service that Mohamed Barkindo gave to OPEC. His dedication and leadership will inspire OPEC for many years to come. Mr. Barkindo played a crucial role in the OPEC Plus deal that saw non-OPEC producers come along with the cartel to moderate global prices when demand plunged in the wake of COVID-19. Well, Mark Belgu Yusuf is here from our Abuja studio with more stories on the news at 10. Hello, Mark Bell. Hello, Coyote. It was quite a full schedule for the president today before he set out for Senegal as he formally presented his party's flag to the All Progressives Congress candidate in the July 16 governorship elections in Oshun State, Governor Buiga Oyitola, while giving assurances that the party is committed to furthering the development journey of the state. While receiving the governor and members of the APC Campaign Council at the presidential villa today, President Mohamedou Buhari commended the governor's performance in his first term in office. President Buhari equally gave kudos to the co-chairs of the Ocean State Governorship Campaign Council, Governors Babajide Songwulu and Abdullahi Umar Ganduje of Lagos and Kano for their efforts so far.
In the courts, a federal high court sitting in Abuja has been asked to stop the All Progressives Congress, the APC, from replacing Mr. Kabiru Masari as the running mate to Ashwaju Bola Tinubu, the presidential candidate of the party, in the 2023 presidential election. Mr. Tinubu had submitted the name of Mr. Masari to INEC as an interim vice presidential candidate. However, two chieftains of the party who were delegates in the just concluded APC National Convention, Mr. Zachary Megari and Zubinatu Mohammed, approached the court to stop INEC from accepting a change of the vice presidential candidates from APC. Amongst others, the plaintiff asked the court to determine whether, in view of the joint ticket provision in section 142, subsection 1 of the 1999 Constitution, the withdrawal of Masari as the candidate for the office of vice president does not entail the automatic withdrawal of Mr. Tinubu as the APC candidate for the office of president for the purpose of the 2023 general elections. Citing APC versus Ishako in 2019, the plaintiff noted that the deputy governorship candidate and the sponsoring party sunk with the candidate when he was disqualified. It is believed that if this suit truly sails through, then not only would the APC will be affected, other political parties with similar arrangements will also be affected. While staying in the court, some reprieve has come the way of the former Imo State Governor, Mr. Rocha Zokoracha, as a federal high court here in Abuja has granted him permission to travel to the United Kingdom for medical attention. Justice Iyang Ekwo ordered the registrar of the court to release the passport of the former governor to enable him undertake the medical trip. The order of the judge follows an application argued by a senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Ola Olanikpekun, who notified the court that his client has been having health challenges. While granting the request, Justice Ekwo ordered Senator Okorocha to return the passport to the court registrar not later than three days of his arrival in the country and fixed November the 7th for continuation of trial. While still at the court, as the Federal High Court here in Abuja, Justice Iyang Ekwo also ordered the National Identity Management Commission, that's NIMSI, to transmit the certified true copy, that's CTC, of the biodata information of an alleged minor to the Attorney General of the Federation for onward transmission to the United Kingdom, where Senator Ike Ikurimadu is facing alleged organ harvesting charges. Senator Ekwerimadu's counsel had, on July the 27th, urged Justice Ekwo to order the release of certain documents of the victim with NIMSI, Nigerian Immigration Service, and two commercial banks. However, counsel to NIMSI, uh, Moazu Mohammed, told the court that the commission's rules does not allow it to give biodata of an individual to a private citizen, but such information should be first handed over to the Attorney General of the Federation. Justice Equo subsequently ordered NIMSI to supply the information or biodata of the victim to the AGF for onward transmission to the relevant courts in the United Kingdom. And still ahead on the news at 10, global oil price benchmark Brent crude falls below $100 per barrel, first time since April this year. That's some business news. We'll join us again. In tackling sexual and gender-based violence and other related issues that enhance gender equality, the federal government must commit to the domestication of some international legal instruments needed to protect the vulnerable in the society. The country representative for UN Women in Nigeria, Ms. Beatrice Ayung, made this call at a roundtable with women CEOs organized by Women in Management and Business, WIMBIS. A correspondent, Bukala Samuel Wemimo, reports. Progress. We have vibrant. WIMBIS, in conjunction with UN Women, holds the second day of frank conversations with female CEOs, women with the resources and within the spheres of influence needed to elicit change. We are going to create a movement of, uh, for gender equality 
and women economic empowerment. After the presentations, it's just as important for Wimbis to get these women managers to commit to a cause of action. So mentally, when what men see are all these girls who are prostitutes, it's difficult to associate that with anything lofty and laudable. Such amazing talent, but the capacity for human resource and capacity for finance we do not have. The Director General of the Public Procurement Agency in Lagos State is in the spotlight at this round table as Wimbis demands a change in the scheme of things where less than 1% of contracts in Nigeria are given to women-owned businesses. And the first part of call is that you have to be on our database. If you are on a database, that's the beginning of the competition. You know, you know this I said, compete. But if you are not found on the database, there is no way we can talk about competition. The co-founder of Wimbis speaks on the progress report that her organization hopes to bring after this roundtable. We need action now. So they, we have a commitment fee. We're going to commit whether it's to fi funding, financing, and then developing dimensions and a structure with which we are going to take action. At the close of proceedings, the UN Women Country Representative emphasizes the need for gender-responsive laws and policies. Nigeria is signatory to CEDO, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. But the issue is that these, all these conventions ratified have not been translated into national laws that are gender-responsive. And sometimes also it's because people don't know them. The women don't even know that the government has ratified. Those who are supposed to implement don't even know. Uh, you have lawyers who don't know about uh, CEDO, for instance. You have uh, magistrates, judges who don't know that in other countries we use uh, CEDO to judge cases. The Nigerian woman can get ahead in her bid for gender parity, particularly if Wimbis contributes its own quota to implement some of these recommendations. From Lagos, Bukola Samuel Wemimo for Channels Television News. And some company news, Dangota Cement PLC has unveiled Season 3 of Good is Bad Consumer Promotion, expected to create 125 millionaires monthly and 25 multimillionaires with over 1 billion naira cash prizes to be won in the next 16 weeks. The event launch held in Lagos marks the official opening of the promotion and the leading cement company says the credibility and transparency of the promo has never been in doubt. It's season three of Dangote Goodies Bag Promotion. And according to the leading cement company, the promo is offering life-changing prizes expected to boost the economic well-being of the brand's loyal customers. That will be the first time that I will ever receive the sum of one million naira in my account. So, yeah. The group managing director, Dangote Cement PLC, says this series is designed to give more value to their customers. Dangote Cement Bag of Goodies promo season three is here to serve, to serve triple purpose. To allow loyal customers of our products continue their projects stand a chance of becoming millionaires and have the capital to extend their businesses. There are different categories and various prizes all for grabs, but first, the unveiling of this season's package. Go sleep, go sleep, wake up. Regulators from the National Lottery Regulatory Commission, its state counterpart and Consumer Protection Commission are present at the launch. The essence of we being here is to ensure transparency and integrity in the course of the promo. What I mean by that is that what the Dangote Cement says they will do is actually what they do. When winners win, they get their prizes. Winning process is buy Dangote bags of cement. Uh, we have Falcon, we have 3X, we have Blockmaster, all quality products. When you buy the bags, open them up. In every bag, there's a scratch card. Bring out the scratch card. There's a panel at the back of the scratch card. Scratch gently. It will reveal your price. Then you go to the redemption center to redeem your price. Then the, for mega, for star price, you have to collect D-A-N-G-O-T-E to spell 
Dangote because the theme of the um, of the promo is spell Dangote and be a millionaire. The management of Dangote Cement Pier also says it will continue to provide economic benefits to local communities with efficient production and keen into strategic growth markets. <laughs> Well, for more business stories on the news at 10, here's Anne Oawodo. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin with oil prices. The global price benchmark has now dropped to three months low as fears of a global recession outweighed supply concerns. Brent crude fell by 3.06% to $99.63 a barrel today. While it's contemporary, that's the U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude dipped by 1.37% to $98.13 a barrel. Meanwhile, a report by U.S. multinational investment bank Citigroup projects that oil prices could dip to $65 a barrel by the end of this year and $45 at the end of 2023 if the global economy sees a recession. The value of solid minerals imports rose by 743 Nine percent to 41.09 billion Naira in the first quarter of this year, coming from 23.56 billion Naira in the same quarter last year. And this is contained in the latest foreign trade statistics report, which was released by the National Bureau of Statistics. Findings in the report indicates that solid mineral imports were dominated by clusters of calcium sulfate imported from Turkey, worth 6.87 billion Naira, and China, valued at 1.87 billion Naira. Other products imported under this category were salt for human consumption from Namibia, worth 5.87 billion Naira, and gypsum from Spain, worth 5.72 billion Naira. We head to Nigeria stock market now to see how it fared today. The value dropped further by 16 billion naira, with a total volume of transactions down by more than 42 percent. As market sentiments remained negative in midweek trading session, let's hear the details from Ladi Williams. Hello and welcome to the stock market report. Well, it's day three of this trading week, and we still have a negative close and added six basis points decline. And it's uh, 16 billion naira wiped off the market cap as profit taking continues today. And it's all red on the activity chart uh, with lower volume seen today, 126 million units of shares uh, traded at about 3,638 deals. The sectoral performance is still red with the banking index down over half a percent. Other sectors we track also down. Let's take a look at the top gainers today. Academy Press is topping the counter Closing at 1 Naira 57 Cobo, up 9.79%, followed by consolidated Hallmark Insurance, while Champion Breweries led the losers' counter to close down about 10%. Well, market sentiment trend towards the bears, with the market differential being in favor of the about 17 advances and it surpassed about 16 uh, losers. And that's the stock market report. I'm Ladi Williams. It's back to you. Now let's find out how major markets around the world fared at the close of trade. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawodo. It's back to you, Coyote. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Well, thank you, Anne. Coming up next, the embattled British Prime Minister Boris Johnson refuses to resign as calls grow for him to leave number 10 down in street. Just stay with us.
The foreign scene, at least 38 ministers and aides in UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson's cabinet have resigned in just over 24 hours, angry at the PM's handling of sexual misconduct claims against former Deputy Chief Whip Christopher Pincher. However, Mr. Johnson insists he will not be leaving number 10. He had faced a grueling Prime Minister's questions after this afternoon and appeared before a Parliament committee hearing where he said resigning was the last thing the country needs. Groups of cabinet ministers have been meeting the Prime Minister to convince him to step down. Simon Busey has this and more in Around the World in Five. And then he slowed. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. <laughs> The 21-year-old man accused of opening fire during a July the 4th parade near Chicago has been charged with seven counts of first-degree murder. If convicted, the suspect would face a maximum sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Authorities reported the suspect fired more than 70 rounds from a rooftop at random people watching the parade in Highland Park in Illinois and then made his getaway dressed in disguise to blend in with the panic-stricken crowd. Authorities said the man had planned the attack for weeks and had come to authorities' attention at least twice before on reports that he threatened suicide or harm to others. At least seven people were killed and more than three dozen were treated in hospital for gunshot wounds and other injuries after the carnage in the Chicago suburb. Vice President Kamala Harris brought her condolences to officials in Highland Park. This person will be brought to justice, but it's not going to undo what happened. And, um, and we, we're here for you and we stand with you. And of course, as we always say, because it is true, our prayers are with you. Russia's Defense Ministry spokesperson has said that Russian forces have destroyed two high-mobility artillery rocket systems in Ukraine. He said that the rocket systems were destroyed in a Ukrainian village near Kramatorsk. President Vladimir Putin warned the United States in an interview broadcast in June that Russia would strike new targets if the West supplied longer-range missiles to Ukraine for use in high-precision mobile rocket systems. Ukraine's state emergency services have released footage showing buildings on fire and firefighters battling flames after Russian shelling hit the southern Ukrainian city of Mykolaiv. Officials have said the shelling hit two areas in the city in the main highway. In one area, 51 rescuers and 13 firefighters were involved in putting out the fires, while in a separate part of the city, 14 firefighters worked to extinguish the flames. South African mourners have gathered in the coastal city of East London on Wednesday to grieve the still mysterious deaths of 21 teenagers in a poorly ventilated local tavern 10 days ago. Dressed in black, they sang and danced to solemn gospel songs in front of 19 of the victims' coffins. According to officials, all of them were empty as police were still investigating the deaths. The remaining two were buried separately by their families. One of Italy's most wanted men, mobster Rocco Morabito, has arrived in Rome after being extradited from Brazil, where he had been hiding. Known as the Cocaine King of Milan, Morabito was arrested in May last year in a joint operation by Brazilian and Italian police. The 55-year-old will serve a 30-year prison sentence for drug trafficking. The mafia boss spent decades on the run using a fake identity in South America. China's state broadcaster CCTV has shown footage of people being rescued from turbulent floods and inundated farmland after heavy rain hit southern provinces in the wake of Typhoon Chaba. A driver abseiled from a marooned vehicle to safety. Residents formed a human chain to transport students from an inundated school and families were rescued using an excavator across Hernan province. Village houses and farmlands were inundated by flood water in Xiaoguan City in Guangdong province. Over a thousand people have been relocated. And finally, thousands of revelers wearing white clothes and red scarves have filled the streets of Spain's Pamplona as the bang of a firecracker kicked off the first San Fermin bull running festival since the COVID-19 pandemic struck in 2020. 
The annual event, which animal rights groups want banned for good, was cancelled in 2020 and 2021 due to coronavirus restrictions. The runs, during which six purpose-bred fighting bulls chase runners through Pamplona's narrow cobbled streets over a stretch of 800 metres, will start tomorrow and continue for a week. They are usually at their most dangerous over the weekend due to larger crowds. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. Rafa Nadal overcame an injury to beat Taylor Fritz and reached the Wimbledon semi-finals for an eighth time earlier this evening, keeping alive his dream of a calendar Grand Slam. The second seed lost the first set and had to take a medical timeout in the second, but raised his game to win 3675, 3675-76 in the match lasting four hours and 21 minutes. For a place in Sunday's final, the 22 time Grand Slam champion will play Maverick Australian Nick Kyrgios, who earlier in the day beat Christian Garin 6-4, 6-3, 7-6. Russian-born Elena Rybakina becomes the first player representing Kazakhstan to reach a Grand Slam semi-final at Wimbledon when she defeated Aya Tomjanovic in three sets earlier on. But Rybakina came through 4-6, 6-2, 6-3 and will face 2019 champion Simona Halep for a place in Saturday's women's final. Rybakina, two sets to one, 4-6, 6 6-3. Defending champions, the Super Falcons of Nigeria say they are ready to rekindle their campaign for the FIFA World Cup ticket and the tournament trophy when they clash with their counterparts from Botswana on Thursday night. The reigning champions suffered a 2-1 defeat to South Africa in the opening match of Group C on Monday and know their work is cut out against the table toppers Botswana who beat Burundi 4-2 on Monday night. That's Sports News, I'm Ayo Tunde. Italy. And the main news again. The federal government today confirmed the escape of 64 high-profile terror suspects following last night's attack at the Kujé Custodial Center. President Buhari says he is disappointed over failure of intelligence as ISWAP claimed responsibility. Of the over 800 inmates who escaped from the facility, over 400 are said to have been recaptured. And that's the news at 10 tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaya Okikili. Good night.